Hi there, and a very warm welcome to Season 6, Episode 1 of People Soup. It's Ross McIntosh here. I work exceptionally hard. I work very, very long hours, and I love what I do, and I'm very driven. But I do feel there's a bit of a hand on my back. And I think in learning about ACT, I became clear that I was not very flexible that I was quite rigid. I had these kind of guardrails almost to protect me so that my concern was I'd forget something. If I wrote everything down, I've had long lists of things I had to do, then I wouldn't forget an action. So everything was all kind of very organized and controlled. But the problem with that was that I was sort of felt like I was walking a very tight, very narrow tightrope, that if I fell off, it would all go to expletive. And that I therefore had to hold very tightly onto the guardrails. It was um, a sense of fear of failure. Uh, Therefore, I need to be controlled in all things. And that, P-Supers, was Charlotte Housden, talking about the evolution of her career as a chartered coaching psychologist, consultant and author. The ingredients Charlotte brings to people's soup are exploration and curiosity, with hefty slices of tenacity and fun. For those of you who are new to people's soup, welcome. It's great to have you here. We aim to provide you with the ingredients for a better work life from behavioural science and beyond. For those of you who are regular P-Supers, thanks for tuning in. We love it that you're part of our community. Let's just take a quick scoot over to the news desk because I want to highlight a research project I was proud to be involved with, with Kamisi Musanje Roscoe Kasuja from the Makerere University in Kampala, Uganda, and myself and Paul Flexman from City University of London. It's in an open access journal called PLOS Mental Health, and the article is called Social Validity of Acceptance-Based Workplace Mental Health Training for Use in a Low-Resource Setting, a qualitative study with Ugandan mental health providers. It's a really important milestone for us all as we're always looking for ways to make the ACT in the Workplace training accessible to a wider audience. And it's an absolutely brilliant piece of research from Kamisi. Congratulations. So, let's crack on. For now, get a brew on and have a listen to part one of my chat with Charlotte. Charlotte Housden, welcome to People Soup. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for inviting me. And I am delighted you're here too. Now, Charlotte, you'll be familiar. I have a research department, and they're just back from their summer holidays, so they're a bit, they're a bit lethargic, to be honest. But they've grabbed some details about you, so I just like to share them with you and our listeners, and just to see whether they've got got it right captured some of the main events and features of you. So let's let's have a look at my notes. Sounds good. Although a bit scary. <laughs> let's see. So it says here, Charlotte is a chartered coaching and occupational psychologist, an organisational consultant, a published author. Her book about change called Swim, Jump, Fly, A Guide to Changing Your Life is something we'll be talking about a bit later. Mm. You are an associate fellow of the British Psychological Society, a blogger, a podcaster, a bungee jumper, and a photographer. I am all those things. Wow. Wow. They're doing pretty well. You are the boss of your own consultancy, and you support executives in organizations around the world. You coach individuals who want to refine or boost performance at work, Clients at a career crossroads looking for purpose, direction and guidance on navigating change. And those with well-being, work-life balance challenges. Does that sound like the people you work with? Yes. Can I add one more? Oh, yes, please. I actually, a type of client that's come to me unexpected is coaches and people developers. Mm. I'm, I'm, I'm sure we'll come on to this, but I am ending up doing quite a lot of mentoring kind of business coaching with them as well that doesn't surprise me at all having read your book Mm. i want to find out a bit more about you first but we'll Mm. come back to the book because i do think it's useful for different populations Mm. right here's another nugget during 2019-20 charlotte ran research where she interviewed 108 people from 27 countries who were navigating career and life changes 
Charlotte then used this as the basis for a weekly blog for 18 months. A weekly blog for 18 months. That's such a feat. Yeah, there's something about kind of set, when you set your goals, setting them at reasonable levels, that the idea of setting such a big goal every week, <sighs> it kind of, yeah, it can be wearing. Yeah. And you then turned your research into a book called Swim, Jump, Fly, A Guide to Changing Your Life. You've been a guest on that BBC radio talking about the book and how challenging change can be. And ain't that the truth? Mm, super challenging. And my research department have come across something a little bit more sketchy. And they said that you were once considered a side hustle <laughs> related to beekeeping. And you were thinking, and I love this idea, if it's true, you were thinking about could you run leadership retreats that involve learning about bees, their culture, their secret world, and helping leaders change their perspective on their thinking about organisations and, and work? So is that something that did happen, this contemplation? It is true. It is true. I came across bees through a friend who had a beekeeper had asked to put his hives at the bottom of the guy's garden, which was full of wildflowers, lots of wildflower meadows. And so the bees loved it. And I was intrigued by this and kind of got into the idea that maybe I could learn how to do some beekeeping and bring leaders of organisations in to learn how to beekeep. And I wasn't very good because you have to wear this full, almost like a hazmat suit with great big gloves and the gloves weren't the right size. And I kept dropping the frames on the bees and the bees kept dying and then they get cross and then they bite you they sting you and then yeah. i came up with great huge hives and it just felt like it seemed like a great idea and then i just it didn't really work but it was i, I like the con the concept and the principle of it which is getting people outside of their and we'll talk about this with act i think but stepping back from your world and looking at things with more distance yeah. I felt like that could have been a really useful thing for leaders to do. And it's also about that connection with nature. Mm. It still sounds phenomenal to me, so... There might be a thing in it. Maybe, hey, Ross, maybe you and I want to do, do a collab on beekeeping. Hey, now you're talking. I can see that we'd look quite fetching in the gear. <laughs> I've never had the opportunity to wear a veil before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm. Hold that thought, Charlotte. One thing as we speak and just start to think about you and your career is, is your curiosity hmm. to do research with that number of people, to, to explore different avenues and your curiosity about new theories, um, how you can support people on change. Hmm. But I'd like to turn that lamp around and get curious about you and just tell us about how you got to where you got to in your career. Maybe tell us some of the the pivotal moments and and we'll explore a bit. Yeah, cool. Well, I started out doing a degree in psychology, but didn't really want to get into clinical or educational. And I didn't really know where to go with it. And I'd always had a love of film and a love of writing. And I ended up working for the British Film Institute on their Sight and Sound magazine and kind of just got into publishing that way and then did that for a few years, but that didn't quite fit. So I went back and studied a master's in occupational psychology and then ended up getting into consultancy. And then for a number of years, I was in HR within an organization. So I was head of leadership development for um, a couple of banks in the NHS. And then I've got a bit of a butterfly mind. So I, inside was interesting, but I missed the outside of being a consultant. So I went back outside to be a consultant. And I did this kind of flip flapping inside, outside. And actually, I think that's really helped me with a kind of mindset of and an empathy for people working in organizations so that I because I have worked within them but I have enough of a distance because I've worked outside of them so I've had this kind of flip flapping between working for a consult different consultancies small ones occupational psychology consultancies a big four twice I left and went back after 12 years but I think I I know that I like variety and I, I am always very curious. So I think I got to the point where I had worked within organizations and I realized that actually I've got quite an entrepreneurial streak. 
and working for someone and in a job doesn't give you the doesn't give me the variety that I needed and actually I needed to go back out again and run my own business for a second time so that was about kind of five or six years ago Hmm. and where I'm at where I am now is half of my practice is consultancy and half is coaching and the reason I love that and I love what I do now but the reason I love it is because they bring me different things. The, the consultancy brings me kind of like a big picture, make big change, help organizations look at the systems. I love, I'm always very good at building models and looking at the world in ways and reducing them down to models that people can understand. So it's all about accessibility and taking complex things and making them simple. I think what I miss with that is I don't see sometimes the impact You know, it's the kind of, if you evaluate the work, you're not sure if it's my input or someone else's input. What I love with the coaching is that you can see almost immediate, if if you're lucky, you can see immediate impact, but also over a period of time working with someone, you can see impact on their lives. And that feels really beneficial and exciting. So I've I've ended up with this sort of space where it's perfect for me, touch wood, Mm. that it carries on for a while, Um, that neither being out, nor being in was enough because I wasn't getting those two things. I wasn't getting the big picture change, but I also wasn't seeing kind of the impact of my work. So it's, it's, I found I've got into like a beautiful space of enough, you know, enough of both, which I love. Wonderful. And it's, it's great to hear about your, I think what you described as flip flopping, Mm. but I see within that a great deal of courage to go to something that think, this isn't this isn't quite right. I'm going to do something different, and then going back, flip flopping could sound a bit sort of I don't know dismissive or a flippity gibbet. I think might be the word, yeah. but it feels like it was very conscious and driven and yeah. courageous, as I say. I, I would add to that that uh, my family weren't excited about it. <laughs> tell me more um well my my father for example worked in one organization for the most of his life they're they're kind of different systems aren't they they're different ways of mindsets that different generations where stability was key and i mean my pension for example was pretty rubbish until i was about i think i only started putting money into pension when i was in my 40s so there was that kind of yes there was that excitement and that kind of courageous sort of entrepreneurial streak but maybe there was a concern that wasn't being very sensible so i'm trying to i'm trying to be and both i'm trying to be sensible and courageous now i think i'm i'm trying to do i'm trying to build the best of both sides Mm. rather than going from one extreme to the other yeah it's so interesting that generational difference because I started my career in the civil service. Yeah. And my parents were delighted. Yeah. Oh, our Ross. And I stayed there for over 20 years. And I loved it in the main. Mm. And then I got that itch that kept needing a scratch. And I remember dreading telling my parents I was going to leave. Because they really saw it as a success. You get a job, you stay with it for life, you're loyal, and you have this marvelous pension. And when I did finally tell them I was I was leaving, they were like, oh, good for you. Wonderful. You've been restless for a while. And they, I was absolutely flabbergasted. How lovely, though, that they, they were aligned with, they were congruent with where you're, you're heading. I think that's lovely. Mm. Now, I'd like to go back to Charlotte at school Mm. and thinking, what led to you ending up studying psychology? Well, I was, there was a time at school where there were two courses, there were two classes that wanted to do simultaneously. One of them was history and one was geography. And I remember at the time, umming and ahhing about which to do and not knowing which to choose and my father had said to me don't do history because it's full of dates <laughs> which of course is quite a kind of old school way of like well you're just learning dates um and i ended up going for geography and then realizing i didn't like geography very much because it was all about rocks <laughs> <laughs> and stuff and actually i liked the people bit and i wish i'd done the history bit 
And so I ended up looking for something that was going to take me down a kind of people route. And there were a couple of things I wanted to do and they weren't quite right. And so I just thought psychology was a really good fit because actually psychology is everything. I know it sounds mad, but it's it, it, we're studying everything because it's humans. So and humans create the human world and therefore, you know, you can go in any direction with psychology or, you know, there's such a panoply of options to go. And I just loved it. I found it just, I think also, I mean, I, I've heard this said a lot and I think a bit with like with coaching, you know, there's the kind of wounded healer thinking that, you know, you find clients or that you work with people that help you to develop yourself, you know, that you, mm. you can, you know, you're looking for, or, or people are attracted to you because you may be a couple of steps ahead of them. And we'll come back to that when we talk about career, because part of the reason I do a lot of career coaching is because I've had some of those challenges myself. But I think maybe in choosing psychology, maybe there was also an element of curiosity, maybe narcissism, narcissism I don't know, but curiosity about myself and who I am and the dynamics of my family and all that kind of stuff. So I think that was also a draw. Mm. So let, let's come on to those career change moments. Tell me about those. Tell me about maybe a couple of those that were really significant for you. Yeah. I'm going to start with the most recent one first, which was basically when I went back to management consultancy and realised quite quickly that, you know, there is a, there is a... My husband loves going, going to the same place on holiday and I it's the thing I dislike. I like trying new things and I like trying to go to places and you can go back to a place on holiday that you've had a wonderful holiday in and then it's never quite the same. You're never quite repeating that kind of wonderful kind of mix of things that you enjoyed the first time. And I feel like that a little bit with going back to a company that you left. I, I left this organization and went back 12 years later and I was a different person and they were different and it didn't quite, it wasn't quite the same as I had had the first time. And I was trying to work out what else to do. And I think I'd become disenchanted with, I did a lot of change management, um, become disenchanted with the kind of big programmatic change management pieces where I didn't feel I was making any difference to the clients because I was such a small part of a huge machine. Um, I had also kind of fallen out, out of love with humans, I think, and uh, <laughs> psychology. And I just, I think it was, I just needed a break. And that's, one of the points where I went to investigate the bees, but I also investigated um, alpaca farming, which is kind of mad. I just thought maybe I want to work with animals, not humans anymore. And I went on this alpaca walk where you get to walk an alpaca through the countryside and qu quickly realized that alpacas are quite like humans because some of them are quite rude and <laughs> they weren't very <laughs> friendly and they only wanted to know if I was going to feed them. And I thought, what am I doing? I don't want to run an alpaca farm. This is crazy. But it was a little kind of experiment. I did lots of experiments. And I came to this conclusion that actually it wasn't what I was doing. It was how I was doing it that was key. And it was the not having the agency and not being in control of my destiny. And, you know, you, when you're a consult management consultant, you kind of fly off around the world. And it sounds very glamorous. But in the end, it actually, it's just quite hard work because you can't do anything in the evenings. You can't really book yourself into courses or your hobbies kind of die away because you just don't have much time to do anything else. It's all a bit all consuming. So I think that for me, that was a massive period of introspection and reflection on what do I want to do next? But that's when I started doing the interviews that then became the book. Mm -hmm. Before that, kind of a, a experience before that was that I'd fallen into publishing early on in my career. And I love writing and I loved publishing. And it was great to be part of the British Film Institute, which is an amazing institution. And I realized that it was taking me further and further away from psychology because actually I ended up doing marketing. And because I was the most junior person, it was my first job. And it, I, was doing the, I was the most junior person in the room. I, I got to do all the rubbish jobs and like packing videos back in the day when we were giving away videos when people subscribed to the magazine I thought what am I doing I've got a degree you know <laughs> I'm packing envelopes um so that's when I went back to study occupational psychology so again that was a real shift it was kind of going back to being a bit more of a specialist I'm super glad I did that because that then got me into consultancy and HR and coaching where I'm today so those are kind of two quite big shifts in mm. my in my career 
there's something that speaks to the uniqueness of you in listening to that. I think mm. the first thing is you're aware of what's going on around you and yourself. Mm. You're really aware and you're prepared to explore. The second one that really sings out to me is your willingness to experiment. I might think one day, oh, you know when you have those days when you think, people, huh? And you think, maybe I could become an almond farmer. Yes. That looks good. I live in an area where there are, there is a, a production of almonds and maybe that would just be such a tranquil existence where I'm just wandering between my trees, probably wearing that veil for no, for no apparent reason. <laughs> and wouldn't that be the life? But mm. here's the difference. I didn't go out and explore that. I didn't go out and speak to any farmers. I didn't go out and buy a veil. I just let it float around my head. Mm. But you have this preparedness to go and learn about bees, to go and on an mm. alpaca walk, to go and do things. You're, you're an action woman. I am an action woman. And there's lots of benefits to being an action woman. If I hadn't have gone down the route that I'm in now, I think another version of me would have been an archaeologist. Because again, it's it's, it's people oriented, but it's very physical. There's a physicality. Well, there are many types of archaeologists, but there are those that go and do the digs. And I think I'm quite a physical person. I've ended up in, particularly when I was working in management consultancy, where I, and at one stage I was doing financial services. And so the product is inc incredibly uh, esoteric. It's it's not real. It's kind of it's data in this in a system. And I think I end up going and doing these things and trying things out because actually that satisfies the physicality in me that work often, you know, we're stuck, we're stuck behind computers, particularly now with you know, digital age. I do a lot of my coaching is online and there isn't a lot of physicality involved. So I think I go and do, I try these things out partly as a mental experiment, but partly as an opportunity to go and do something physical. And another thing I did was, I, I trained as a declutterer. This was in my period of don't want to to, to um, be in an office anymore, you know. And that is a very physical job because you're actually going into someone's home and removing stuff and moving stuff around and helping them to kind of like make sense of their lives. And I feel like I do. I am still a declutterer. I help people in coaching to declutter their thinking or declutter their choices. So that that was a good thing to have trained in it. But um. What put me off was the smelly socks under people's beds. <laughs> like, I didn't want to do that bit. I liked all the kind of like sorting it all out so it looks beautiful at the end. But um, there was a there was a kind of an intimacy, I think, with people's lives. Perhaps I was a step too far for me. And I love how you've transferred it to your coaching practice. Because mm. how many of us feel that our minds are cluttered? Mm. Yeah. yeah. But it's just like that. there's one curiosity explored after another it's it's wonderful yeah thank you how do you manage your energy oh yeah and that's a really good question because i don't well i am better it's a work i'm a work in progress on this this is part of my challenge because you know i said oh it's great to be an action woman and i wanted then to say and there are some disadvantages and i thought i'll i'll save that for later <laughs> <clears throat> there are some disadvantages because i tend to throw myself in at the start i have this enormous amount of energy at the start of things very enthusiastic and um I, I often oversell myself and people think oh she's amazing and then they don't realize that i've borrowed energy from the end of the, the the piece of work i've taken what would normally sit at the end and i now use it at the start and so then my mm. energy fizzles out you know i'm kind of halfway through to kind of midway through and then i just i haven't got that enthusiasm or the energy so much so that's i have to find ways to keep that energy going or have people around me that are better at finishing things off so yes that is that is difficult and I have so many different parts to my coaching practice and different things that I do I mean for example I recently um, ran a session with the EMCC so European Mentoring and Coaching Council on grow your business so this was for coaches and I came up with a whole set of new models and ways of thinking including coaching essence which is something you touched on which is the um, uniqueness of us as coaches and people developers and what we can look at in our past that kind of makes us 
unique in the work we do now. And that cr- included creating a whole set of new ways of thinking, which was great. And it was a really good opportunity for me to kind of consolidate my thinking and clarify my thinking. But it's a whole bunch of more stuff that I had to do on top of everything else that I had to do. So I do find it challenging actually to balance my energy. And I do have a propensity towards um, huge amounts of energy and then a dropping off. Is that a kind of natural cycle that you're you're accustomed to, or is it is it something you're you're wanting to work on? I am accustomed to it because I've been like that forever, and I want to work on it. Hmm. I'll give you an example. So, I one of the things I do in my spare time is I run. I'm part of a running group, and I did a run yesterday, and I do a lot of trail. But I live in an area that's got beautiful hills. It was a race, and I did a trail race yesterday. And it was, it was 15 kilometers, so it's about nine and a half miles. Very steep inclines and very steep drop-offs. And it was going over stiles and through woods. And where I live, it's been raining a lot. And so it's very slippery and slidy. I always start out too fast, always. And I have to stop myself. And, and also because I end up getting very drawn into the competitiveness. If there's lots of people around you and they're all running faster. <laughs> and I'm thinking, I don't... I don't want to get left behind. So I'm kind of running faster. So I'm running with them, but they're fitter than me. So they can keep at that pace all the way through the 15 kilometers, whereas I can't. And so I have to, I have to pace myself better. I did not too badly yesterday pacing myself. Just doesn't matter what anyone else is doing. Just slow down. Think about the fact you're only three kilometers in. <laughs> you still got another 12, 13, whatever to go. So I'm getting better at it, but I, it's a challenge for me to pace myself. Mm. Goes back to that energy point. Yeah. And there's something we spoke about when we were planning this this episode and this conversation, and that was about rigidity in life and mm. career. I wonder if you could speak to us about that, either reflecting from your research or reflecting on your own life. Yeah, I mean, we did talk about this, and it's something that I, I feel having having got into act, uh, I've, I realized how rigid I was, that my memory is not very good. And I'm a bit disorganized. So the way that I get stuff done, and particularly having worked at a management consultancy, where there are a lot of processes and systems and ways of working, and you have to be really on the detail. And so I kind of learned a way of being really on top of everything by just being very controlled, having lots of lists and lots of spreadsheets and lots of goals and lots of things and working. I work exceptionally hard. I work very, very long hours and I love what I do and I'm very driven, but I do feel there's a bit of a hand on my back. And I think in learning about ACT and I had 18 months of ACT therapy before I started training in ACT, I I became clear that I was not very flexible, that I was quite rigid. I had these kind of guardrails almost to protect me so that my concern was I'd forget something if I wrote everything down, I've had long lists of things I had to do, then I wouldn't forget an action. Um, so everything was all kind of very organized and controlled. But the problem with that was that I was sort of felt like I was walking a very tight, very narrow tightrope, that if I fell off, it would all go to expletive. And that I therefore had to hold very tightly onto the guardrails. And also I'd lose momentum if I didn't keep going things would just drop off and I'd forget and I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I'd fail to turn up to a meeting or get something done or, so it just was this kind of, it was a running away move rather than a running towards move. It was um, a sense of fear of failure. Uh, Therefore I need to be controlled in all things. So what's helped from ACT that's helped you, helped you recognize this rigidity and help you maybe release the brakes on that control? I think I had an epiphany with with ACT. It was one of the key things for me was, well, there was partly the running away, running towards moves. It was the sense that, you know, why am I making choices? Is it about fear of failure or loss? Or is it because it's something that's exciting? And, and, you know, we know that most moves are a bit of both at some level, but is the propensity towards running away from something? So that was one key thing. But another really big epiphany for me was that being human we can't avoid difficult feelings or thoughts that we can cope with them better we can put them in their context we can stand back from things and then we can make we have choice points we can make choices of how we react to things and so 
I mean, an example being, I tend to do all the cooking in the house and I do, tend to do all the shopping. And I have a, a, a delight in things like chocolate and bread. And I my body isn't so keen on particularly bread. I don't react that well to wheat. So the way I, did, I have in the past dealt with not eating in inverted commas, the wrong things, although there is no such thing as a wrong food, but my body doesn't cope particularly well with wheat, was not to buy them. So I became very kind of structured and very uh, rigid about not purchasing things. And then I would find myself in situations where they were accessible and then I'd just eat them. So my way of, of dealing with choices on food was to just have a very rigid purchasing, cooking approach. And now I'm a bit more flexible. So I will just say, oh, it doesn't matter if we have something one night or it doesn't matter if we go and get a curry. Or, it's fine. I'm running, you know, I'm looking after myself. There's a kind of much more of a flexible approach to just being more fluid and, and just going with the flow a bit more. It makes my husband happier. And if he's happier, then I'm happier. And then we have a better relationship. And therefore, maybe I'm not eating food that's around, you know, dealing with stress or under pressure so it just feels like it's i feel like i'm mm. loosening up does that feel kinder towards yourself as well yes yes and 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 it's interesting that sometimes when one is kinder actually you end up not making that choice anyway because i will say to myself oh can't just have it you know doesn't matter have that no one cares like the run yesterday i was keen to get in on it under two hours i did do it under two hours but in the past i would have berated myself there was a really steep bit going uphill and there were other people running it and I just thought I can't I'm gonna to have to walk this bit and in the past I would have beaten myself up say come on you've got to go harder this is not good enough you need to drain more now I just think well look, I've got a lovely medal I got round it I did it under two hours might move on doesn't matter you know there are other people who did better than you but they're fitter than you I could devote a lot more of my time to getting fit but mm. actually I've got too much I want to do in my life so it's a choice between, do I want to go out? I don't want to go out six times a week training. I want to do some fun stuff. You know, sometimes that, the more we kind of work towards a goal and we become very, very focused, the less chance we have to do other stuff. And then it doesn't become fun anymore, I think. Absolutely. And I really see those values of playfulness and fun and humor in your coaching. How do you integrate them in? How does that, how does that work with clients? It was funny, actually, because I've always been in the past. I, I was always the kind of funny person in my family, and it was a way of releasing tension. And and I, I kind of got it from my dad, who was also very playful. I, I was using it in my coaching, but I, I studied it. As I did it. Uh, I did an essay for a diploma in coaching psychology, which was on playfulness and coaching, uh, uh, playfulness and humour in coaching. And I suddenly became aware of the disadvantages of it, and that actually sometimes it could be about avoidance or it could be about a power move. So I'm much more judicious now in the way I use it. I came up with a little tool that coaches can use on how to choose when to be playful or humorous. And also I became very aware in my studies on it that humor isn't just telling jokes. Humor is actually, it can be a mindset. It can be a kind of alternative way of standing back from a challenge or a problem, mm. which again is very act kind of congruent and playfulness doesn't mean just being silly it can actually mean playfulness in the way that you orientate different views of things that you have a different mindset or you change the orientation of your thinking and so I use it a lot actually in my client work if I'm not clear whether someone will take to it I tend to use self-deprecating humor so I test it on myself first or I do a tiny playful move to see whether it lands. And then there are some clients that don't react well, and then I pull back on it. And then what I tend to do is I might try later in the relationship when there's greater trust or comfort. So I, I'm now, I think I, I'm now much more um, measured in the way I use it. Before it was just sort of a bit of a kind of, it was a skill of mine or it was a strength, but I just didn't tend to think about it I just mm. tended to use it naturally so I think I, I I hold back a little bit more on it it's interesting developing that that kind of flexible approach with the humor because it's something I I think I bring naturally to, to coaching and facilitating and sometimes I do sit back afterwards and think 
Uh, was that too much? You're not doing stand-up, Macintosh. Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> I think I've become more aware and really prepared to maybe choose to not say that thing. But also, like you, seeing how things land. Yeah. And there's a lot of evidence that can be really powerful in doing the research you know it can really help with the relationship building it can create a, you know a more collaborative co-production environment which is what coaching is all about it, it can really deep deepen mm. the thinking and the inquiry i think it's it can be really really powerful i just think we need to be careful because if i think about some of the kind of humor i've used in the past as as society moves on we have we start having different parameters about what is acceptable and not we need to keep up with that and make sure that we are aligned with that and that we're not being offensive. I also think, going back to what you were talking about in terms of cor courageousness, there is also an element of um, self as instrument as a coach, that if you can bring more of oneself, and the act is so congruent with this about self-disclosure, I'm really for self-disclosure mm. in the right amounts, because I think in disclosing, I mean, I've been on one of your training programs, <clears throat> and in that you there was self-disclosure and that made you a warmer presenter and somebody who was more relatable and um you also role modeling act in the training program so it's an invitation that um for us to role model imperfection as the delegates of that training program but so i also try and bring that in my coaching that i am not perfect i'm still working on staff i'm just trying to provide a container in which we can do the work so i think sometimes you have to be courageous and try something and it may not land but also ask for forgiveness if it hasn't landed. I love that. Thank you. Gosh, it's such a joy just to chat to you, Charlotte. I could go on, but I also want to come on to your book as well. So I think we might just shift tech. And I just want to ask you a question that I ask all my guests, which is about your song choice. If you had a song choice that would announce your arrival in a room, real or virtual, and I mean any room, like the supermarket, your lounge, when you go and visit friends, this song plays, just a snatch of it. And it's not forever, it's for the next two or three months. What, what would your song be and why? It's interesting, when we were chatting before and you said people think long and hard about this, and I remember thinking, oh, well, I'll come up with something very quickly. And I came up with a whole range of different songs. I thought, no, that's not quite right. That's not... And then it came to me in a flash, it's mm. Nina Simone, Feeling Good. And I just love that song for lots of reasons. A, because it's just a cracking song. It's got swing and big band and it's got violins and it's got you know, like tinkling piano and it's got her beautiful voice. But also just the, the, the sentiment of it is just so wonderful. It's about freedom. It's about joyfulness. It's about being glad to be alive. And it's also a little bit about reinvention, you know, and I just thought, I'll read the, um, what she, she sings. It's a new dawn, it's a new day, it's a new life. And for me, there's also that sense that However bad our day has been, we can go to bed, we can get up the next morning, we can have a new day, we can start again. There's these, these, these wonderful opportunities where the, the slate is clean again. It's a new day, it's a new dawn. We can keep learning and growing and developing. We can say sorry for the mistakes we've made. We can change course, we can pivot, you know, we can create new worlds for ourselves. And I just love that. Yeah, it's just a lovely song. Absolutely love it, thank yeah. you. That's it. Part one with Charlotte in the bag. Next week we'll be back and Charlotte will talk more about her brilliant book, Swim, Jump, Fly, A Guide to Changing Your Life. You'll find all the details for this episode in the show notes at peoplesoup.captivate.fm or wherever you get your podcasts. If you like this episode, we'd love it if you told us why. You can help me reach more people with the special people soup ingredients, stuff that could be really useful for them. So please do share, subscribe, rate and review. Thanks to Andy Glenn for his spoon magic and Alex Engelberg for his vocals. But most of all, dear listener, thanks to you. Look after yourselves, peace supers, and bye for now. Pronunciation. Housden. Housden. That's what I would... I didn't know whether to go Houston or Houston. That sounds very northern. Houston. Well, I, what I get a lot of is... Um... Oh, we have a problem, Houston.